<laughs> Dude, never did it. Welcome back to Never Did It. I'm Brad Garoon, and I'm here with Jake Ziegler, my best bud, who I get together with to talk about movies from the last hundred years that we've never seen. Jake and I, each episode, assign each other one movie from a given year. And this year, that year is 1987. And Jake, you gave me the movie Wall Street. You want to tell me why you gave me the movie Wall Street? Yeah, absolutely. Wall Street is uh, a very quintessentially 1980s movie. A lot of the images and and things from it are just are very uh, stereotypically 1980s. And I think it's a really good summation of the, you know, a lot of things that were going on in the decade historically. I also think it's tremendously entertaining. It's got a great Michael Douglas performance at the center of it. And it's an Oliver Stone movie. I, Oliver Stone is pretty hit and miss, I, I think, throughout his career. And I think this is definitely one of his one of his better movies. And it, yeah, it's tremendously entertaining. And I thought you would like it. Yeah, I was kind of surprised. I hadn't seen it. So th- this movie, it's what is advertised on the tin. It's a movie about Wall Street. <laughs> I was going to say Emilio Estevez. Charlie yeah. Sheen is a young Wall Street broker and, and has dreams of doing more. And his dad, played by his real life dad, Martin, is a union worker. Yeah, union worker repairs. Uh, he he works on airplanes. He works for right. an airline. Yep. Which becomes relevant later in the film. Early on in the movie, Charlie Sheen's character goes to meet with Michael Douglas's character. The If you've heard the name Gordon Gecko, it's from this movie. It became a really iconic character, kind of in the vein of uh, Patrick Bateman from American Psycho became a well-known. Also, from the same time period, I mean, obviously American Psycho was produced after the 80s, but it takes place in the same time period in the same world as Wall Street and Jordan Belfort from Wolf of Wall Street, and and then the fictional characters, well, Patrick Bateman's fictional, thank God. <laughs> well, and all the fictional characters from, like, say, Boiler Room, which is a great movie, a little bit more modern, but about brokers living that wild broker life. Young guys who have too much money and get it too quickly kind of life. I think these kind of movies are interesting because they're kind of analogous to mob movies. Mob movies are usually about a young guy who gets involved in the gang, gets a lot of money, and then everything blows up, and these movies kind of have a similar trajectory. But it's funny that the iconic character in this movie is not the protagonist, played by Charlie Sheen, but the villain played by Michael Douglas, Gordon Gecko. It's interesting just to see Sheen's character fall under the thrall of Douglas's character throughout the movie. There's an interesting sort of love triangle bit going on with Daryl Hannah. How could there not be? That's Mrs. Neil Young nowadays. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. They've been married for, I think, four or five years at this point. Yeah. Wow. Good for you, Neil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he leveled up on that one. Also, you know what? Good for you, Daryl. Uh, Neil is definitely more respected in his field than Daryl is, although she's great. She's she's great in this movie and she tends to be great in anything she's in. Honestly, I think she's one of the more underutilized actresses in Hollywood history. Yeah, I liked it. I, I didn't love it. It's funny. I actually think Wolf of Wall Street is one of the lesser Scorsese movies. I, I don't think it has as much to say that's interesting as a lot of his movies. I do really like Boiler Room and I do really like American Psycho. But this mm-hmm. one, this one's good. I think the most interesting aspect of this movie is the relationship between the Sheen and how Martin's pro-union, anti-capitalist philosophy really gets in the way of what Charlie Sheen wants to do. And that comes to a head when Gecko tries to make a deal with Martin Sheen's company and it, and it blows up. It's a bummer to see him disappoint his father that way. Yeah, I think it's very good. I actually, I, I have it rated similarly to, to Wolf of Wall Street, but I think in a lot of ways it's actually better than, than Wolf of Wall Street. And I think such an easy answer or you know, one easy reason is that it's shorter. I mean, I think Wolf of Wall Street at, at three hours, I've, I've always kind of called it a, a really good two hour movie stuffed into a three hour sack. Yeah. And I think, and, and Wall Street, I think moves along uh, you know at a lot better pace. It's a lot more focused. It has those two key relationships, like you said, are between the Charlie Sheen character and his father, and then the Charlie Sheen character and Gordon Gecko, who he is enamored with as the movie starts. Like, you know, you don't know where he first, you know, heard of him or anything. He's just like right away. He's like, I need to meet this Gordon Gecko guy. And he has to, I think he calls his office, you know, 30 or 40 times and tries to get a hold of him and, you know, brings him a gift on his birthday and everything. And he's really you know, kind of obsessed with this guy and really wants to live that Gordon Gecko lifestyle. And it's got this really great, you know, memorable Michael Douglas speech, you know, where he says the famous line is, has kind of been truncated to greed is good kind of a tagline from the movie but the actual quote is a little bit longer he says you know greed for lack of a better term is good and it's a whole you know big monologue and you know a classic michael douglas performance i mean i think a lot of other michael douglas performances you can kind of see going you know going all the way back to this one it's very a lot of what he's done is very comparable to this one it's i mean certainly one of his better performances and certainly one of his more famous ones that people talk about a lot it did win him his oscar it's the only time he's ever been nominated for anything and and yeah it's interesting that he got it for playing a villain who's 
really a bad guy. I mean, there's not, there really aren't any redeeming qualities about him. You know, he doesn't have any moments where you're like, oh, I see why he's, you know, why he's done this or what pushed him to this. Like, no, he's just a dick. He's just a bad guy. He uses Charlie Sheen, you know, for, for and he uses everybody around him, but he's interesting. He's a really compelling, charismatic character and it's fun to watch him. Can you tell me a little bit about its sequel? Uh, it's called Wall Street Money Never Sleeps. It came out, it's also directed by Stone. It came out in 2010. I always want to, I don't know why in my bones. I mean, sequel taglines are funny. So this one's Wall Street Money Never Sleeps. The jokes are always like something to electric boogaloo. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, but when I hear Wall Street Money Never Sleeps, I always want to say Wall Street Never Stop Never Stopping, which is just a top star. <laughs> <laughs> the Andy Samberg pop star movie, which is great, by the way. We watched um, it recently, my wife and I, and it's yeah, still amazing. But yeah, tell me about Wall Street Never Stop, Never Stopping. Wall Street Never Stop, Never Stopping. I I actually haven't seen probably since it came out. I so I don't have a lot of a lot of info on that. I remember it being solid, you know, like a decent sort of movie. I know this is when Shia LaBeouf the we're, we're still trying to make Shia LaBeouf like the next big star. Mm -hmm. uh, that that didn't exactly pan out, but I remember it being a solid movie. Personal Shia LaBeouf issues aside, like his personal life aside, I'm pretty bummed that that didn't work out. Not that he's He's, he doesn't bat a thousand by any stretch, but mm -hmm. when he's on, he's really on. Like Peanut Butter Falcon is such a great movie. Mm -hmm. Oh, even like Honey Boy quite a bit. Yeah, Honey Boy is um, very good. Yeah, Peanut Butter Falcon's very good. And those uh, came out right around the same time. Yes. Yeah, right. But, yeah, uh, it might have been the same year. So we had that good little streak, but I just realized that this is the only Oliver Stone movie I've seen. Not not Never Stop, Never Stopping, uh, the, the original. I, I've seen a lot of JFK, but I can't say I've seen it because I haven't watched mm. it all the way through. I tried watching W and I, I really got irritated with it in the first like <laughs> 20 minutes and stopped. Mm. I've never seen Born on the Fourth of July. I Platoon. keep meaning to watch Platoon. Those are the um, movies when I went to Oscars. I've never seen The Doors, although my wife really likes it. And I've and I've only seen half of Natural Born Killers. So yeah, it's weird that I haven't seen more Oliver Stone. I think a lot of that's because you have always been of the opinion that he's hit and miss. Yes. And so I just always sort of assume he's gonna miss and I don't bother. <laughs> it's funny though, a lot of the ones that you just mentioned are are those are the hits. Like those are the ones that are good and worth watching. Like Born on the Fourth of July is is very good, especially uh, Tom Cruise is really great in that. And Platoon is excellent too. Another really good Charlie Sheen performance. It's amazing too. Charlie Sheen, we're talking about, you know, trying to make Shia LaBeouf like the next big star. I mean, Charlie Sheen was that guy in the late 80s. You know, he did Platoon and he did Wall Street. You know, he, so he did like these dramas. Then there was Major League, which was a pretty big hit. You know, he did The Wild Thing and Hot Shots, you know, came out kind of right after that too. And, and yeah, Charlie Sheen was, uh, it, it's just with the way he's been in the last you know several you know decade or so the charlie sheen that we know is not the it's not the big time movie star of the you know of the, of the 80s that yeah uh, and and, know, and for a lot of the same reasons a lot of like personal self-destruction right i am a huge fan of the schlocky action movie the chase starring oh, charlie yeah. sheen and christy swanson I, I just think that movie's a blast and and mm -hmm. the red hot chili peppers are in it just doing crazy stuff and oh wow yeah it's a it's a real stupid really fun movie I feel like I might have seen it when it came out years and years ago, but yeah, I don't have any memory of it. That was like a watch it all the time on HBO movie when I was a kid. Yeah. All right, cool. So I'll have to watch more Oliver Stone. I'll have to. I mean, after Oppenheimer came out, everyone was like, well, you got to pair this with JFK. And I, all I can think was who has eight hours to watch both of those movies? Right. <laughs> yeah. Or the, the, I think there's a director's cut of JFK. And then I think there's a recent documentary, like, you know, re-exploring JFK or something like, you know, looking back at the movie or something. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of material on that. JFK, I've, I have seen too. And it's, it's very good. I understand it's not very historically accurate. I know Stone is, again, very hit and miss with what he, you know, what his facts are. You know, again, I'm no scholar. I'm no expert. It's hard for me to say, you know, you know like how, how true whatever it is. I just know like what's an interesting movie and what isn't, you know. I don't know how much that really matters when it comes to something like this. I think as long as you go into it, no, now the problem becomes, and especially with the with the Kennedy family, which there's such a lightning rod for conspiracy theories. And uh, even now with with RFK Jr. being right. uh, running running for president, you have to be a little bit more careful with that stuff. But in general, these are massive figures of history, and we don't have to inform our lives by what a movie tells us. We right. can just go and try to be entertained. I don't know if a three-hour movie about a court hearing <laughs> Kennedy is interesting, but I'm, uh, I'll am i find out in a few days, I guess. Uh, yeah. Wait, did, did you give me JFK on our list? Oh, I did give you JFK. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we'll be talking about JFK at some point in the future on this podcast. Excellent. Good. I'm glad I did that. Okay. Wall Street. I, I liked it, but didn't but didn't love it. And I don't have a, a ton to say about it. I, I do think it's like a great diversion. We watched it on a Saturday night. It was like a, a perfectly good Saturday night movie to to, uh, to watch and uh, enjoyed it quite a bit. But by the end, I think we were both like, oh, that that wasn't as satisfying as we thought it would be in yeah. the, in the <laughs> yeah. last act. Yeah. And even in that last act, obviously, you know, the, the bad guy gets his comeuppance. But I mean, the guy who gives him his comeuppance, I mean, he did a lot of bad stuff too. Yeah. You know, well, like, he, okay, so but it doesn't, it doesn't work out so well for him either. He's kind of ruined too. And that, that aspect yeah. of it, I did like. That's 
true. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he's got to face the music also. But I mean, I agree most with that. I gave it, you know, I give it a four star rating, which for me is like, yeah, I think it's really good. It's really entertaining, but it's not, uh, I, I wouldn't put it in like, well, I don't know how many movies I've seen from 87, but it's not like an all, it's not an all timer for me. I just think it's very good. Really enjoy it. But yeah, the Michael Douglas performance, you know, if you're a fan of Michael Douglas, it's kind of essential for his catalog or like if you're an Oscar nut, you know, this was the one and only Oscar that he's been nominated for and won as an actor. He actually has an Oscar for, he, pro- he was one of the producers on One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest uh, when he was very young. So he oh, actually wow. has two Oscars. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting, interesting little factoid about Michael Douglas. But it's, yeah, the one and only one he has for acting. And it's the the one and only nomination the movie got. So yeah, definitely worth watching. Very, very good. And uh, yeah, Michael Douglas is is terrific. Uh, so speaking of movies you gave four stars to, let's talk about Tom Popo. People who are very aware of Tom Popo know that this movie came out in 1985 in Japan. But our rules are we go by the American release. So 1987, Tom Popo. I gave Jake this movie because it rocks. It's by Juzo Itami. This was, I think, his second movie and the one that made him a massive director in Japan. You may not have heard of him because even though he made 10 feature films and a short film, all of which were really highly regarded uh, in Japan and some of which were really highly regarded in the United States, his career was cut short because he died prematurely, which is something we'll talk about in a little bit because the story around that is unbelievable. Let's talk about the movie first. Uh, This is a movie about ramen um, (laughs) and learning how to make great ramen and learning how to be your best self. And it stars in one of his earlier roles Ken Watanabe, who's just great in it, but you barely recognizable compared to the man that you see in all these movies that come out, including the upcoming, what's that called? Collision? His huge sci-fi movie that's coming out next about robots taking over. Well, I'm not sure. Oh, right. Because you don't watch trailer. But you, you no. must have seen the trailer during Oppenheimer for... There were no trailers when we saw Oppenheimer. No way. How'd that work out? Well, because it's uh, because it was the 70 millimeter, they didn't make any trailers to go with it. That's interesting because we saw non 70 millimeter trailers and it, it was really hard to follow them. Anyway, this movie's called The Creator. Oh, OK. It's coming out. I don't know if the writer and SAG strike are going to affect its release date, but it's coming out soonish. Looks wild. It stars yeah. John David Washington. Oh, and cool. It's about a robot uprising or AI or whatever. But anyway, Ken Watanabe is in it. He's in this. It also stars Tsutomu Yamazaki, who is this sort of cowboy truck driver who's the wise older man. And it also stars Nobuko Miyamoto, who is in real life, was in real life, the director's wife, and she featured in all of his films. And she's sort of the protagonist of this movie. She's the one who needs to make ramen good. And the movie's interspersed with clips. Some of them are feel kind of random, but they're all about food. Uh, this is just like a love letter to food. So there are these interstitials interspersed uh, into the narrative. Some of them are about like a kid who goes to a work dinner with a bunch of older colleagues and embarrasses them by showing off how much more he knows about fine dining than them. There's uh, a group of women who are learning how to eat spaghetti more politely. But most of them are about a gangster who has like very strict rules about eating and movies and things like that. But the but the main thrust of the movie is this woman learning how to how to cook ramen. What did you think of Tom Popo? Really enjoyed it. It did take me a, a few minutes to see a couple of those kind of interstitials that that aren't necessarily related to the plot, particularly of of the woman making the ramen, and you know to kind of understand how the story was being told. Uh, but once I did, I, I I really did enjoy the movie. I liked the main storyline thread a lot. Did not know that was uh, Watanabe until later like i did not recognize him until probably at least halfway through the movie and when i had paused it and i realized i was like oh my gosh yeah that is him <laughs> that is him and he's just he's uh, a little baby he's just a baby yeah i mean i really I, I love movies where it's just about you know kind of one singular thing and it's like okay this is the obsession i need to get better at cooking ramen or the rest of the movie is going to be about how do we get better at doing that and they go look at all their competitors and they you know analyze how they make it and they analyze not only how they make it but how they serve it and how they interact with the customers and, and all that And there's just a lot of really intricate little pieces to it and, and having just recently finished season two of uh, The Bear, uh, which is also about, you know, kitchen, you know, kitchen life and cooking and food and all that. I thought it was kind of an interesting comparison there to see how or not comparison, but just like just seeing a lot of food stuff lately. And it's just been really interesting, you know, to see all these different perspectives on that. So really enjoyed the movie. The two lead performances, I think, are great. The woman, Tam Popo, thought she was just was wonderful. The relationship she has with the older cowboy truck driver. Yeah, the relationship that they have is really sweet. It's not overtly romantic, particularly, but there's, you know, some hints of that. It was really nice. And I think some of those side, uh, like, I guess, side quest stories you know, came out. I liked some of them more than others. Yeah. Loved, loved, 
loved the one where the, the young guy was ordering, you know, all the great food, you know, with his older, well, the older guys who all order the same thing, you know, uh, filet of soul with yeah, consomme, yeah, all that, and, and, uh, and a Heineken. And then the other guy, he keeps asking all these great questions and ordering all this interesting food and, you know, the drinks and everything. And he knows the sauces. He goes, oh, this is made by so-and-so and this is how they make it in France. And the guy's like, oh yes, our chef trained there and everything. He's like, oh my gosh, this is so, in- I loved that one. There, and then there were a couple I didn't think worked quite as well, but for the most part, really interesting way to, to tell the story. And, and I didn't know much about this movie going in. Two funny things about the interstitials. One, I love the text message that you sent me while you were watching it, which was, did not expect this movie to be, to feature two people passing an egg yolk in between their mouths. <laughs> And the other, I thought that the way that they used makeup to show the embarrassment on the older executives' faces in that scene, I mean, that stuff's used in anime all the time. It was really yeah. cool to see it in a real movie, in a live movie. Yeah. Speaking of Tom Popo, uh, who is, I mentioned, played by Nobuko Miyamoto. So like I said, she's the director's wife. I thought it was really cool, two things. One, that the central relationship was between two middle-aged people. Mm-hmm. And that this movie was a huge hit was great. Uh, shows mm-hmm. that not everything has to be about young people. Like Ken Watanabe is in it, and he's he's featured a lot, and he has a lot of really funny lines. But he is not the star of this movie by any no, stretch. Not at all. Yeah. Um. There's huge swaths of the movie that he's not in. And then the other thing I really liked is that Miyamoto is not just in so many of Juzo Watami's movies, but she's the star of most of those movies. Now you could say, okay, it's nepotism. But on the other hand, we were just talking about in a maybe an icky way that Daryl Hannah doesn't have anything to do anymore. This is a woman who was the star of major movie after major movie after major movie. He never took a shortcut and was like, okay, well, not never. I haven't seen all of his films. Literally, I think with the one exception, they're all on the Criterion channel. So they're all accessible. It's just so cool that they're female-led movies and that they were popular. And it makes me bummed out that we don't get that opportunity here as much. Like what could, Char- Charlie Theron has a great career. What could it be if someone like a Scorsese decided that not Leonardo DiCaprio, but Charlie Theron was going to be his star? Or if Denis Villeneuve decided after Arrival that he was going to keep making movies starring Amy Adams and not flip over to Ryan Gosling and then now Timothy Chalamet. It's interesting how a lot of these, like Scorsese, I think has one female-led movie, right? Alice doesn't live here anymore. Yeah, Alice doesn't live here anymore. Yeah, definitely. New York, New York is kind of, is kind of like a co-lead with De Niro and them, but that movie's just, it's not so good. I haven't um, seen it. I've only, yeah. I've seen Alice doesn't live here anymore and it's great. But um, yeah, Alice doesn't live here anymore is excellent, which is kind of like, okay, why, why hasn't he tried that again? Clearly can do a movie uh, with an interesting female protagonist. He just chooses not to. So the only person really doing this on a huge scale or that we're noticing, and maybe this is recency bias, it probably is, is or was Greta Gerwig with Saoirse Ronan, although now she's got Margot. So who knows what's going to happen next? But Saoirse could always come back for the fourth movie. Right. Uh, you never know. It would be great to, to see more of this because it's wild that this happened in the 80s and 90s. And doesn't mm-hmm. didn't happen here. Like Julia Roberts, even Julia Roberts' career, like she led a handful of movies and then she disappeared because she got too old. And it's not, I don't know, she was good. She's look, she's not on the level of Sir Sharon, I don't think, no. but she was a clear draw. People love her. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I I don't get it. Yeah. And well, and she did a lot of uh, Gary Marshall movies. That was kind of maybe one of those director star combos. Uh, you know, Gary Marshall did like Pretty Woman and Runaway Bride. Yeah. And a lot of her movies. And yeah, I mean, they were all success, you know, a lot of them hugely successful. But then it feels like, uh, like I said, at a certain point when they get to an age, like Hollywood just stops trying. Like they're not even like they're not even making an effort to put uh, like a Julia Roberts in, the, in, in these movies anymore. I mean, honestly, I'm trying to remember. It was what the last thing I really saw her in. Take it to Paradise. I, oh, right. Yeah. Which I haven't seen. Kind of first big thing for her and uh, Clooney for, for, in, a, in a long while, I feel like yeah we complained about Clooney's participation in that movie recently and now Julia Roberts's participation and you can come back to us and be like well what about Meryl Streep and I to that I would say well what about Meryl Streep that's great that she's able to do that she's one person for one thing and for another there's no one that's like taken her on and been like I'm going to have mm-hmm. her star in all of my movies so right I have to tell the story of Juzo Itami and his the end of his life because it is nuts yeah, and I don't know it, so I'm interested to hear. Okay, so first of all, he was an actor before he was a director. He didn't start directing movies till he was 50, and then he became the oh, top wow. director in Japan for a while. They wow. were calling him the next Kurosawa, which is just crazy. That's Yeah, that's not nothing. He made a movie called Mimbo, The Subtle Art of Japanese Extortion, which was a takedown of the Yakuza, and they attacked him. They slashed his face and tortured him, and he wound up in the hospital. And then sometime later, he jumps off a building and commits suicide and leaves a note that said that he was doing it because he was humiliated because news of an affair that he'd been having was about to become public. And then news of that affair did become public. But 10 years after that, a Yakuza boss admitted to an American journalist that he had killed him, that he had said, you either jump off this building or I shoot you in the face. You might survive if you jump. You won't survive if I shoot you. And he jumped. And he did not survive. That was what the Yakuza gang leader had said to this American journalist. So the story doesn't even end there. That's crazy enough. Like what an insane end to this guy's life. 
that journalist, I think his name is Jake Abelman or something like that. He wrote a book called Tokyo Vice. And that book was adapted to an HBO television show that's still on that stars Ansel Elgort as the journalist and stars Ken Watanabe as his Japanese counterpart, which is just a crazy full circle situation. I've never even heard of that show. I didn't know that was current. The first episode, it's produced by Michael Mann. And the first episode was directed by Michael Mann. Interesting. Yeah, I, feel like I should have heard of that. I like Michael Mann. I mean, dude, you watched BoJack Horseman like five years after it ended. You're you're behind. I know. I still haven't watched Breaking Bad. So, you know, crazy. We'll get there. Um, so don't have too much more to say about Tom Popo. I think it's wonderful. I'm really excited to watch more of a Tommy's movies. I haven't yet, but we gifted my father-in-law a Criterion uh, membership. So we were like, well, let's do it too. So we got ourselves a Criterion membership. So we're going to, I'm going to start watching those uh, uh, Tommy movies. Today. I'm really excited to see more of Miyamoto and, and of a Tommy's work. Yeah. There's a lot of really great stuff on Criterion. I I get lost there every couple of days, probably just looking at stuff that they have. I'm like, oh, I should watch this and I should watch this and I should watch this. And it's a, it's a deep rabbit hole. It's wild, especially with HBO Max taking down so much stuff and hbo max mm. is like the movie streamer it's yeah. good to have criterion which obviously has more movies but um, some of them are less accessible one day we're going to talk about johnny mnemonic in black and white yes <laughs> real quick do we want to go through our top movies of 1987 i know we don't we probably don't have a ton but i uh, don't have a ton but yeah so i have a top five from 1987 and i'm happy to go first while you pull yours up yeah at number five i have broadcast news can't go wrong with albert brooks oh yeah no, not at all at number four i have uh kubrick's full metal jacket great movie uh, number three, Moonstruck, very underrated by me until I saw it comedy. And I was like, oh, this is not what I thought it was. This movie is bonkers and great. It's great. Yeah. Norman Jewison uh, is is really incredible. Great. Yep. Uh, number two, we got the Coen brothers raising Arizona. Great movie. Yeah. And at number one, kind of an obvious one, The Princess Bride. Yeah. Hard to argue with any of that. Oh, boy, this is tough. Speaking of 1987, I went to trivia recently. Uh, one of the questions was this so-called king of the soundtracks did a song on the Sylvester Stallone movie from 1987, Over the Top. I watched that like a year ago. I never would have guessed Kenny Loggins. Not in a million years. Oh, yeah. That is a bummer. Because, yeah, I, I might have gotten that one. I know Kenny Loggins pretty pretty good my top five first you have a couple of honorable mentions i've seen more movies from 87 than i realized raising arizona would be an honorable mention for me i i, I do love the coen brothers that's a great movie a couple of others from 87 that i thought were great i really like the living daylights is the bond movie from that year with timothy dalton never um, did it yeah it's it's actually pretty good i actually like both timothy dalton ones uh three men and a baby came out that year uh that was mm. i think the highest grossing movie that year is really funny and fatal attraction was another michael douglas movie from that year which is also very good those would be my honorable mentions as for the top five Number five, I'm going with Predator, which I still think is a, just a great action movie. Number four for me is Bertolucci's The Last Emperor, mm -hmm. which was the best picture winner that year. And seems like it would be one of those like boring, stuffy, long best picture winners, but it's actually really great. David Byrne does the score for it. So that's awesome. That's sweet. Um, yeah. Number three, then we're getting pretty similar here. Number three, Moonstruck. Number two, Broadcast News. And number one, uh, Princess Bride, of course. Easy top three. Throwing a few honorable mentions too. I think I've got four. Predator also, Spaceballs, Lethal Weapon, and Radio Days. Oh yeah, Lethal Weapon. How does that? I might have to mark that I've seen that on uh, Letterboxd. I must not have that marked. But yeah, first Lethal Weapon is great. All right, cool. Thanks for joining us for 1987. We'll be back next week with the year 1943. If you want to know what is coming out next week, go to our Letterbox profile. You can find me at Brad Garoon on Letterbox. I think Jake, you're Jake Ziegler on Letterbox. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, Jake underscore Ziegler. And both of us have pinned to our profiles, our Never Did It podcast list. You could also just search for the Never Did It podcast list. And the two movies that will be discussed on next week's episode are always at the top of that list. So check that out. And thank you for joining us for Never Did It.